Welcome to this Alex Social Podcast. I'm here with the Four Week Natural crew with my my manager, the Four Week Natural manager, Simon. Simon, say some words and wave your little avatar over there. If you guys are hey going guys, to, good to meet you. There he is. If you guys are going to do a program with with us, you're going to speak to Simon before you do the program. We have Mr. Munich over here. If I get to the immersive view, say hello, hello Mr. Mr. Munich. How's it going? Mr. Munich is one of my students. He's actually done four three four week naturals and we just did uh croatia together and he's basically like this tall beautiful handsome frenchy justin bieber german dude who is very successful we're going to tell you about him in the stories today <laughs> mr canada is he's actually a health and fitness expert and he helped me a lot with the tinder health and fitness program that we've made and he's my personal trainer as well we have got Mr. Wimbledon, who used to be my roommate. He's done two four-week naturals, and he was in Croatia with me recently. Say hello. Hello, hello, Mr. Wimbledon. <laughs> he's a very charming, dapper British gentleman. And Mr. New York over there, he's one of my assistants. He's done one of the programs with me. He's doing the program again with me here in Warsaw. And he's the, the resident skeptic, right? He's the voice of the students. Say hello, New York. Hello, hello. Very nice. I'll introduce you in a second, Simon, a bit more about you in a second, Simon. But today what we're going to speak about, everyone, on our agenda is we're going to break down some things happening with Dating by Blaine. We're going to talk about some of our students' experiences. One of our students finished four-week natural and he went to fight on the front lines in the Ukraine. I'm going to talk about a catastrophic breakup that I had with my fiancé recently. We're going to talk about what happened on the four-week natural in Croatia. We're going to talk about the four, uh, the summoning, which is the, a party with 70 people, with the students and all the girls and all the debauchery and the setup and the successes that happen with that. Simon, what else do we have on the agenda? Biggest frauds in the dating industry, me kicking Max's ass in racing, RSD Max that is, or Max Torno. Simon, what else we got for today? I think what might be interesting for some of the guys is how to consistently pull tens for the guys that actually want some information from this call as well. How to consistently pull tens, sure. Yep. Besides being a drug dealer or a movie star, sure. What else you got for us? Um, how should men actually approach while conveying still attraction and strength? Cool, we can go into that for sure. And these other guys on the call are experts with that. What about you other guys? What other talking points do you want to go over today? I mean, mainly the absolute shit fuckery of Havar, but, um, but I'm sure we can uh, cover that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll start with the ball. shit fuckery of Havar. That's the Save most recent. Save my life for hell on that boat. So I'm going to bust your balls on this podcast. <laughs> you tried to convince me that I slept with a, a transvestite. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. Uh, Munich, what are the talking points you have for today? Yeah, I'm curious to hear what gossip you have about other dating coaches that you dislike. I think that's always, that it... always interesting to hear the most most recent gossip or also the gossip of the past few years. I've got some things to say, and I'm, I'm a bit different to other coaches in that Australians are quite likely to talk really positively about people and also to speak openly, skeptically about people. We'll, we'll talk skeptically about people pretty openly and hold them accountable. It's an Australian thing, so I'm happy to do some of that. So load up those questions and we'll get into them in the next 60 minutes. What about you, New York? What are we talking about? Some Chad Stud shit? Giga Chad Stud? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Always Chad Stud shit. No, I would say uh, Simon nailed it on the head, you know, just how to approach, you know, while conveying that attraction, conveying that strength. And uh, yeah, what you think of other so-called dating experts who say that actually cold approaching is a low value behavior. All right, let's get into that. Okay, let's line it all up. With, um, yeah, we can do some screen shares. I'm really, I'm really interested in this Blaine stuff because I made this big, uh, massive Tinder program. We recorded about 210 modules over six programs, all about Tinder, and I studied the Blaine program. My roommate had her program, and I went through it, and it was really interesting. So we can talk a little bit about that today, a bit of controversy for you all, but all for the greater good. So, Simon, where should we begin today? Maybe with Havar? I think one topic that would be very interesting, considering you're also kind of going through it right now, is how to get over a breakup when you're really emotionally stuck with it. I think that's something a lot of guys will probably want to hear about and can relate to. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, 
Sounds good, Simon. Okay, well, let's um, let's start with Croatia because we were all there. When, um, Munich was there. You did the four-week natural. Wimbledon was there. Canada was there. And the other guys almost made it, but you didn't quite. So I wonder, Wimbledon, I can, of course, describe the, the summoning, the summoning, but can you try to describe it for the audience? What is the four-week natural summoning? So the four-week natural summoning are events that you organize, but we are all friends after we've done the program. There's a kind of group of high-level individuals that all stick together in their cities, but also across the world. So we gallivant in different cities across the world, and we all meet up, have a good time. And if we happen to meet some nice uh, female friends out there, then we go off and have adventures in, in various beaches and uh, dark alleys in Havar. But the main point is that we all have a, have a good time. And in Havar, we had a massive boat party, I would say, was the highlight. Yes, yeah, yeah. It was the so, best boat party we've ever done, for sure. The best party we've done so far. Right, right. And, you know, Munich, you, you and I have been going to Havar and doing the four-week naturals in Croatia for about nine years now. And I've done boat parties every year and they get better every time. But so for everyone, the sum, what the summoning is, is, it's kind of this exclusive party only for guys who have done four week natural. And anyone who's finished four week natural, five weeks immersive training with me, you can then um, you get invited to go to the summoning. And it's in places like um, the party island of Croatia, or we had a mansion in Colombia or we took over Thailand with scooters and parties and full moon party. And we did Vegas as well. Me and Wimbledon, we went to Vegas with like 15 guys. We did tables, bottle service. But the thing is, what makes it so good is with my kind of organizing power, I get a couple of hundred bucks from each guy and then we can do our tables. But everyone, all 15 or 20 guys that do each of these summonings, they all are trained at the highest level and you can all meet these guys from all over the world with great businesses, incredible game, high standards, and you all know what to do immediately. I remember the first, the first night of the first summoning, you and me, Wimbledon, we were in this club in, uh, in, Las, in Las Vegas and we just go in there like a fucking SWAT team. We know what to do, what to say, what to ask, and before you know it, where everyone's naked back in the hotel room in excess or in Encore. And then it just continued every night like that with the pool party and the beach party. And so, you know, when I finish a program in the US, we do Vegas, I finish a program in Croatia, I go to, uh, we, we do a boat party. And this one that uh, Wimbledon and Munich and Canada was at, I organized this boat. We each put in about 300 euro and then we had a hundred bottles of champagne and we had a, it was like an 80 foot boat with a DJ stand and we organize 50 girls to come on the boat. But what's different about this for cold approach guys like us is that we, we organize the event. So we can just go around the island and decide who we do or don't want to invite. And then here's the dress code, be there this time, bring your bikini, have five bottles of champagne. And it just became debaucherous. Imagine like 20 guys with pirate hats, spraying champagne, and then all the girls, they don't know each other. We all know each other, like 20, like 20 of us, and the girls don't know each other at all, and they need to socialize with everyone, we give them champagne. It's just a heroic setup, right? But you have to have finished the four-week natural in order to do it. So Connor, you wanna tell me some of your stories, maybe about kind of the, the glorious after events. We'll get to my, my uh, demise <laughs> a little bit later, but um, we'll edit, sorry, Wimbledon. We'll edit that out just a second ago. Uh, Wimbledon, you want to tell us about some stories about the uh, the event, the the summoning event in Havar? Well, a lot of the guys were already in Havar, like Mr. Munich over here, and they had been going out and inviting girls to this glorious boat party, and you had organized a registration page, and we had a, an Instagram page of over, I think it was over 100 girls by the end of it were on this page. Um and the event was a lot of the guys all coming together and trying to recruit girls for, you know, four or five. I mean, Mr. Munich was doing this for a month before uh, living in, in Havar, recruiting for, for these girls. And the event was uh, trying to have a great ratio, uh, making sure we had a great vibe, 80 foot boat, a DJ, and then going out and, and just having a good time. And the thing that's great about it is I really struggle because this is is 
it's not something that your average mate that you know from university or school does. This is a very much a, um, I, I see it as a hobby, but some some people see it more as, um, how do I describe it? I mean, back in the day, the RSD stuff, I think, went more into a cult. But you, I really struggle to find guys that are just normal and into this. I think the really good thing about Four Week Natural is me and Mr. Munich, we, we shared a room. And we both knew like it was going to be ridiculous because you know we've we've been doing this a long I'm time. Concerned. Yeah, we, I, I knew right. Me and Mr. Munich, if we're sharing a room, it's going to get because we both know exactly what we're doing. It's almost without question that one of us is going to go gallivanting off and and and, and pull people back to the room. And, and this Havar was no exception. So me, I met some M- love Munich people. during during the event, ladies and gentlemen. He, I think he consummated maybe 12 or 15 conversations that's just how this guy rolls he, he's you know he's he's very well well trained and he's a great guy how many consummations did you have munich i don't know 100 percent over the course <laughs> of the summer quite a bit i would say probably around a bit more than 15 yeah it's just ridiculous you're there for like for 30 days and you you intimate well, I was there a bit longer. I was there for almost six weeks, I think, total. Right, 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 right. So, so the guys got it down pat. And uh, back back to Wimbledon, um, yeah, they, they were staying together and they both really know what they're doing. But the thing is, you know, you have to build up to, to know what you're doing in order to do it. But it's good. You don't, didn't even know each other until the event. You meet and then you're just working in tandem, having a great time and hosting great you know, little after parties with these these girls you meet. Sorry, man, continue. Oh yeah, so I mean, the, the, I mean, we'll get into it. But the MVP of the trip was um, a certain individual. We'll give him a code name. Um, um, Danny Bobo. Baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever you want to call him. He brought three girls to the boat, and all three of them hooked up with guys. Mine was a lovely Eastern European girl, and she gave me a lovely session of reading the Bible on the beach. Um, <laughs> and we. Uh, we uh, yeah, many verses, and then we went back to mine and read a few more verses. So, I mean, I wasn't there for the whole summer like Mr. Munich, but the time I was there, I definitely had a, had a good time. It's and brilliant. There are so the, many verses from the Bible already. <laughs> as, as the day goes on, on this boat party, it's, it's really nice to see our guests, our female guests. They, they're like, okay, this, this party's pretty wild. We don't know these guys. But then they relax, we drink, we get talk, and the girls think we are allowed to just let loose and have fun and we're on the boat. I mean, we as the guys, we own this massive, awesome boat. We're all dancing up on the DJ stage. And then the girls are thinking, like, which guy are we going to pull? They start fighting for these guys by the end of the party because we have this incredible ratio. So it's one of the few times where you can actually set up the dynamic that you want to have. And by the end of it as well, I've made sure that everyone is dressed properly, behaving properly. We had our boy from Slovenia, cutesy boy from Slovenia. He's carrying around uh, the, the tray of champagne to the girls all the time. We had, we had our man from France like in a fucking pirate costume, hanging off the roof, giving people bottles of champagne. It, it was wild. And we, I'm gonna flash up some of the images here in the podcast as well so you can see what's going on. And uh, the next one that I'm organizing is in uh, Thailand. Another event in Thailand will be go-karting and full moon party and maybe renting a boat as well, something like that. So it's going to be wild. What about you, Munich? Any other stories from Croatia that you want to, uh, what's the word? Reminisce, reminisce on while we're all here. No, I love, I love at these parties how basically in the morning everyone is kind of like stiff and it's like, oh, this is a bit weird. There's, I mean, especially at, on this boat, I mean, we were all on this huge boat and I don't know the exact ratio, but we were like 80 people. It was like 25 guys and 55 girls. And you can, you could feel because nobody knew each other that well. So all of like, almost everyone was a bit stiff in the morning. And then we went to lunch and everyone started to get drunk, some more, some, some less. And when we got back to the boat, oh yeah, and we had the race in between. We, we went to a beach and there was this floating castle. And I think that was almost the highlight. And then we all ran to this jumping castle and fought and the challenges. And I think that's what warmed everybody up. Then we had lunch and got more drunk. And from that point on, it was a proper party and everyone was having a blast. And yeah, it was sick. It was sick. I remember your girls like constantly rubbing, rubbing your back, hoping that she doesn't lose your attention to one of these other girls. Um, 
and and Wimbledon, the girl that you were aiming for, that girl from Serbia, she had a boyfriend the whole time, but you're not screening as quick as you need to be. The, the friend of, uh, of of Munich's girl. So she was she had a boyfriend the whole time. That's why you couldn't kind of get in there. Well, I was just winging Mr. Munich at that point. Um, well, I had multiple different targets, um, Alex, but a certain individual got absolutely blackout drunk and I had to escort them home. So all my targets freaked out because I was wrestling with you. Um, so, yeah, I, had, I was screening, but my plan sort of fell apart. <laughs> Yeah, so bad that. I am, I am always, really, really sorry about that. Always blame other people, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, the, okay, the reason, the reason why, everyone, the reason why we started the summoning is because of a guy called Ray. This guy from Australia who's done a whole lot of boot camps, who's an absolute pickup dating game machine, and I'm sure he's going to come on this podcast one time. And Ray is always like, get fucked up, cunt, get fucked up, like telling me to get drunk. And I don't normally drink, and then eventually he just keeps feeding me shots, and I'm like, fine. And then... I don't remember getting back on the boat after lunch, Wimbledon. I, I don't remember. All I see is like photos of me kissing you and our uh, Romanian, tall Romanian friend from fucking London, but basically kissing everyone. Next thing I know, there's photos of me having a cake smashed in my face, and then I'm trying to beat you in a game of rugby, and apparently I lost. So, and then I wake up in bed the next day, and I'm like, ah, oh, God. Blame it on the guy who started the whole summoning. And then, but thank you for getting me home. Nah, no problem. That's what friends are for. It's so funny because everyone was panicking. Everyone was like, oh my God. And I was like, this is a normal Saturday night in Britain. Like, you all need to calm down. And, you know, you're Australian as well. Like, exactly. What, you, you couldn't walk. So I was basically carrying you home. I put you in bed and then I go out. I'm like, right, I'm not letting this ruin. So I then go to the club. I meet my um, Eastern European friend and I, ma I still managed to, to close that night. So it didn't, it didn't uh, dampen my spirits. Let's just put it like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I needed a good sleep. It was a lot of organizing for that event. So it's just sleepy. It's just, just sleepy. I've been training hard with my trainer over here. Um, no, but I, I'm really glad. I can't wait to do it again properly next year after kind of changing uh, and even upgrading things a little bit more. And we'll have a whole new batch of great guys on the event next year as well. Next year, it's going to be a two-week natural, however. But I might do two times two-week naturals in Croatia in the summer because Croatia in the summer is so popular. But it's, it's expensive and it's complicated to get there. So but it is very, very special. I wonder, any other talking points about that, lads, or Simon, do you want to move on to the next topic? Yeah, hold well, on. I, I did hear that you... Go ahead, New York. What's your, what's your skepticism? <laughs> Always got a skepticism, that's for sure. So, okay, you know, you guys are talking about this amazing party, right? And it sounds super fun, but right? You know, like, you guys are attractive guys. I know you guys, right? You know, mm -hmm. what if someone is like... You know, just average looking, right? For all the guys out there, right? Who are probably looking at your program. Most of them aren't, you know, like super Justin Bieber type looking guys, right? Is there still hope for them? Can they still pull the way Is that you Justin, guys pull? Justin Bieber is like the, the pinnacle of, of looks. Well, on, on the boat party, even our man Dean, he is he is not Captain America, right? This guy, Dean, that we're referring to. And he, he's like charging around the island, super charismatic. He's an American guy. Have you met Dean, New York? No, I'd love to though. I think yeah, he's going to be here in Warsaw. He's going to be in here in Warsaw tomorrow, so you'll meet him tomorrow. But he's brilliant. He's from the East Coast USA as well. But he's um, American Asian, um, a, an increased body mass index, right on the higher side. But just a fucking barrel of laughs, super fun, getting everyone involved. And when I did my program with him, I taught him charm. And for Americans, which is what you are, it's basically saying, excuse me once in a while and, and slowing down. And, and then, yeah, he could, he just charmed his way. He became charming plus the positive energy and a man with a plan and he did really well. But we had a couple of other nervous guys on the boat. If you guys remember Munich, remember the guy, uh, he's from Latvia, shorter guy, real estate. And he's Jewish as well, actually. So he's kind of almost a bit of a stereotype of like, arguing too much, questioning too much. And then he calmed down, had a good time, wore the stupid hats, got into the swing of things, and he's just got female attention all over him. So he, he's like the troubled stereotype, but at the same time, he just had four and a half weeks of training, and he's just like your avatar, like a, a, a Ukrainian, Middle Eastern, uh, Eastern Jewish guy, Eastern European Jewish guy, surrounded by women. He was having a great fucking time. And I don't know what happened afterwards because I was a bit sleepy, but he had a great time. So, no, it, it's brilliant, man. And I make sure that we, 
everyone in the community makes sure everyone is involved, which is the good thing. Um, there's no negativity or judgment except when I'm fighting Wimbledon over here to prove that I'm better at rugby. And you're right, Wimbledon, it is just a regular day. There's no need to be stressed about it. And everyone was telling me to party. So what can you, what can you expect? You know what? I, I really want to um, talk about this. So on that note of being good looking and, and, and that question, um, Alex will attest to this. I had such a good time on my four week natural in London. I did my first one with Alex in London that I think Alex will agree. And for, for a long time after I got pretty fat, I was pretty fluffy. Like we were in Vegas together, Alex, and I was pretty fluffy. I, I, I can admit that. And I'm you, not... you were worse in Finland. You had like your belly hanging out of your shirt, but you had that beautiful German girl, like traveling around, following you around like a puppy. She was a freaking babe, a smoke show to say, yeah, you were like Santa Claus. Well, so in answer to that question, I have been fat and I'm not the best. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a troll, but I'm not the best looking guy in the world. But I will tell you for a fact, my best results came when I was fat. I'm not joking. And Alex can attest to this. My best yeah. results came when I was fat. So this whole, and I'll pro we'll probably talk about this down the line, but this whole new age red pill thinking that, oh, only good looking guys or only rich guys or only jack guys can get girls. That's not true. I will flat out tell you that is not true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, in my experience, that's not true as well, because I had an awesome time in London with Alex. So let this be a lesson to those out there who are questioning themselves because of their looks. There's no need. Yeah, I think <laughs> another thing is everyone that goes through the program for four weeks, they are there, they they come in as whatever they are, and then they are, it's like, how do you say that in English? They're like, the stone that gets shaped into a diamond or whatever, like they just become a lot better. They learn to dress better. They become more charismatic. They become more fun to be around. So by the time we had this boat party, everyone that was there was already at a pretty good level. And then we just create the environment where things happen, I would say. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, everyone is on the same level. I always say with the guys who do Fort Natural, it's like you have to be humble enough to learn and adventurous enough to take massive action. It's a crazy rare combination that one one of those guys the cutesy guy from slovenia um who we all know and love he wouldn't fucking dress properly for the whole fucking program him and the latvian guy the shorter latvian guy so anyway with the slovenian guy i grab i was in the fucking shop and we were arguing with the lady for like 20 minutes and he's like he tries on these shirts he's not going to fucking buy them and then i grab him by the shirt i get the shirt i put it on the counter the lady who works there knows me for like five years and I take his, I literally go into his pocket and take his credit card out and purchase the shirt without his consent. <laughs> and he's like, what, what the fuck? What the fuck? And then he's like, I love that you did that. Thank you. And he never stopped wearing the shirt for the next like eight days when it was on the island. He's like, Alex, I love this shirt. I really love it. And the girls were like, your, your, your shirt looks so fucking good. Your eyes look amazing. He's like, Alex, can you take more photos of me with this shirt? I'm like, man, why don't you buy more shirts like this? It's like, I love this one too much. So yeah, I, I'm fucking twisting some arms to get everyone up to the standard. I'm not always the nice, friendly Alex that you see here on the, on the podcast. And I can attest, Mr. New York over here, he's a pretty tall, gangly, geeky, glasses-wearing, mm -hmm. um, overly analytical motherfucker. But you did brilliantly, man, on the program. These, these really hot girls hanging around with you the whole time. You look, and by the end of the program, you're like, you have no sleep. You have, you've run out of money. You're staying in hostels. You're fucking tired and confused because you have dates and interactions and staying up late every fucking night. It's brilliant. I love it. I love it. Um, Simon, yeah, let's move along. Let's keep the variety in the show here. Yeah, we just spoke about some of your war crimes, stealing people's credit cards. But I heard there was another guy actually in the community that actually went to Ukraine. So what's the story about that guy? Oh, the Ukraine guy. Good segue, by the way. You guys catch that? Some war crimes. That was a fucking awesome segue. Uh, and Wimbledon knows about this as well. So we had this guy. He's got a wild name. Like he's got his parents named him after a pop star. Like imagine he's imagine they, they would call him. What's a good metaphor, Wimbledon, of this guy's name? Oh, like Michael Jackson or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Like his name is like Mike Jackson or something. Uh, it's not that exactly. Or oh, what's another name? Um, like. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, Lil John, like his, his name is, he got named after like a pop star. And so you know, he finishes the program. This is, it, the reason why we bring this up was on a talking point for today 
is because it puts shit in perspective, you know? So he finishes four-week natural, and he's a Spanish guy. And he decides, fuck it, I'm going to go and sign up to go on the front lines of the war in Ukraine. And we're like, why? He's in our group chat. He's like, he's got this big, crazy, goofy smile. He's like, I, I don't know. Can you see Wimbledon, the, the, the Mike Jackson smile? Like, let's go. So he's like in the fucking trenches. He's training with Belarusian soldiers. He's got his mates. Um, and Wimbledon, do you know a bit more about the story? I know that he went. I know that he came back. I know some of the shit that he went through. But he was like bombarding your group chat even more. What, was, what the fuck was happening? What did he do over there? Well, I think he got conned into thinking that he could leave whenever he wanted. So mm. he got recruited to fight in Ukraine, which, you know, if you have any moral thinking about the war, I completely understand why you want to do that. Did he volunteer or was he conned into it? Do you know? Well, he volunteered. He was getting he paid a very, very small wage. Um, right. But... He, he got recruited by someone and the person said, oh, you can return if you ever want, whenever you want. Now, you then get to the front line of Ukraine. He's got no proper equipment. He's asking us for money to send him, you know, to send him supplies and stuff like that. Right. I remember now, yeah. He just thinks he can get the next taxi back from the front line. And I'm, I'm messaging him. I'm like, mate, you need to get out of there because... You can't, and then then he realizes that he can't leave whenever he wants. And actually, they have no because he's not in a proper unit. He's not in a proper Ukrainian army unit. He's in a you know foreign foreign legion unit. Um, he's got no proper artillery cover. They've got no air cover. It I mean it's a really really dangerous situation to be. So it was dumb. It was really dumb. Right, and the reason why it was coming up so much is because he was on the front line, and one of his uh, his colleagues was a Belarusian female soldier. And the whole time in the four week natural group chat for, for London where he did it, is like, how do I fuck this girl on the fucking front lines? And we're like, man, man, just get the fuck out of there. Like, thank you so much for fighting for our fucking freedom. Thank you for, you know, saying goodbye to your sanity and then taking up arms against something you believe in. But let's just, let's just focus on like, you know, surviving the next fucking day rather than trying to get your fingers sticky with a female soldier. And the, the, the story that stood out for me is that he did have frontline con conflict, this guy. You know, he was under fire, and then they had face-to-face -face contact with Russians, and they were held at gunpoint, and they were going to be taken cap captured, right? And he then, uh, the Belarusian, who was fighting on behalf of the Ukrainian, the Ukrainians who had already had, like, family members died or something, the guy who he was trying to sleep with, she could hysterically talk her way out of, you know, su summary fucking execution. Is that how the story goes? They were going to be fucking executed by the, the, these Russian guys and she talked them out of it or, or something to that effect. Do you know the story? Uh, I'm not sure how much of that was, was uh, real, but I think um, they did get into some hot situations. Like he sent us some videos which were uh, pretty, pretty ropey. Um, you know, yeah. they're, they're being sent into, you know, trench warfare situations with no air cover. Um, you know, it's some crazy situations. And I just found it so funny that in the group chat, all we were talking about was whether or not he was going to bang this girl. <laughs> that, that's all he's fucking talking about. He's like... The girl that was engaged with uh, another guy from the group or something with his leader or something, right? The, the leader was trying and simping over him like a... It was like a Finnish guy or something. Classic Finnish guys, always simping. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, then he was trying to steal her and then it didn't work out and then he'd keep making a move and they're snuggling in the fucking trenches. Fucking wild, man. And then, and then, and then at the same time, I have a student complaining to me about reapproaching in a club in London. Meanwhile, fucking Michael Jackson, which is his name. Yeah. Michael Jackson's on the fucking front line being shot up by Russians to fight for our theoretical freedom, the, the principle of fucking freedom. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because it's one of the most kind of profound stories that's happened in the last couple of days. But he's back. He's survived. He's signing up for more programs. He's a valued part of the community. He's, a, he's an exciting part of the forward natural community. And hopefully he watches this and we thank you for your, your service, Michael Jackson, which is your, your pseudonym. I've never met the guy, but I've also never been so invested in someone else's game journey. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope that he does well. That's the best He's... field report I think I've ever heard. 
he, <laughs> I think he was getting some action when he came back, but he lost like 20 kilos training hard. And he, um, uh, he, we're trying to get him to come to Warsaw, New York, to come out and join the event this month, but we'll see how he goes. Simon, what's next? Yeah, let's, uh, we've been talking about, I think, our community a little bit and the guys in there. But uh, as you know, we're not the only community. There are more dating programs and coaches. So maybe you have any gossip or complaints about other guys in the industry. Do I have anything specific? <laughs> any, it's pretty broad. Anything specific from you guys on the panel here? New York, Munich, Wimbledon. Anyone you want me to specifically think about or comment on? Well, Alex, I mean, we live together for a bit and you know that I have dealings with, I don't want to say the person's name. Um, should we, uh, let's just call him Jack Black. Um, Jack Black is, is the guy. Do, do you know the guy I'm talking about? Um, th- you could be referring to a couple, the, the guy who does the book or the guy who does the podcast in the US. The guy who does that, the podcast, not the guy who does the book. The guy who does the podcast. Like, that oh, the podcast of... surrounded by all these girls with microphones, the American Yeah, dude. yeah. I mean, look, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this whole, you know, panel discussion uh, forth that's, that's come up, this whole new red pill um, sort of manosphere, manosphere stuff that's come up because of the death of... I'd call it the because of the death of RSD. RSD basically got assassinated. And this whole new wave of, of men's self-help people are now saying, oh, it's all about being good looking, being successful, being jacked, and then the women will come to you. Now, you can probably tell from my tone, I have an opinion on this, but I'd really like your opinion because you don't come from that frame. I believe you come from a frame of there's no reason you're not enough. It doesn't matter if you're jacked. It doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't mean if you're good looking you should, um, you know, uh, uh, approach anyway. Um, so I'd love to hear your opinion on this whole new wave of, of red pill. Yeah, so just to, to reference this, I think who you're referring to is, is Michael Sartain. Um, and what is it called? Man of Action Academy or something? Yeah, that's his program. Man of Action. What is it called? Man of Action, you were, you were right there. Man of Action, yeah, yeah. Um, and... and Tell me, Wimbledon, how, how is it, uh, how is it red pill? Like how, how do they talk about red pill? What's what, what, how do they do it? I don't even know. Well, he's actually, I don't think he would say he is red pill, but what I mean is that there are shows like Fresh and Fair. There are shows like the whatever podcast. And there's this whole new wave of, of people where they say, okay, actually in order for you to be attractive to women, their philosophy is that you actually need to be rich, you need to be successful, you need to be jacked, you need to be at level 10 in everything you can possibly be. And then you won't need to approach women, the women will come to you. Now, they have oh, certain, I see. Nuances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. certain nuances where they say, actually, you know, you can't just sit on your hands, you have to show being successful, whether that be on Instagram, or you have to have a big social circle. And you know, I do a lot of that anyway. So I'm not saying that. So for example, I think a lot of what some of those guys teach is really good stuff, but I, I'm not sure the philosophy is is what's actually helpful for guys. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah, I do have some thoughts on this, and my the the, the purpose of my of me contributing to this conversation is to um, is to add to this, Stellian. I'm just gonna kick you. No, you're cool. I'll leave you there, Stellian. That's fine. Welcome, Stellian is a video editor, so you can just keep a track of what's going on. Um, uh, so with, with the Man of Action program and, and Michael Sartain, when I was in RSD and, you know, everything that I say here is going to get back to, to Sartain and everything, that, that's cool, that's fine. Um, when I was in RSD living in Los Angeles, Sartain would be over at the house all of the time. A good guy, energetic guy, really well connected with Tyler. He, this is a guy who makes shit happen. He's hustling and making things happen. Um, and he historically has been like a, a big time nightclub promoter and really good with social media. And the guy loves girls with, you know, beautiful women, beautiful women with beautiful breasts, right? Does really, really well. He's a war veteran, that kind of stuff. And so from a business point of view, I see that this guy, he sees a, a kind of a slice of the market that is, that is everything politically correct, above board, and all of his marketing, can, can, he can shout aggressively and blog aggressively about you know, self-development, take action, be social, and he's not risking any negative backlash 
from promoting guys to approach girls and make moves on, on girls and women and to make things happen with women. And that's a huge risk. So he's taken this slice of the market where you can make so many moves and empower so many guys and good, that's good. That's fucking great. Really, really great. And if he is kind of just only on that one track and telling his guys to build your Instagram, go to the fucking gym, build your social circle, do your networking, that's all really, really good. But what he's missing where a guy like me comes in, he's missing that complete element of you know leading the horse to water. He is not focusing on how you should speak to girls, how you might need to deal with uh, tests, how you might need to deal with a lack of interest. And the premise of you know, male capitalist society is that if you go to the gym and you work hard and you're a good person, you are supposed to, you can expect, you can expect that women are supposed to like you or respond to you or something like that. But that expectation breeds anger and frustration and disappointment, and that's a huge worry. So the difference in thinking, the difference in schools of thought where I come in is that you can't expect shit. Even if you're, you haven't yet made anything of yourself, you can't expect anything, but you're allowed to ask. You're allowed to go for things. You're allowed to stand up for yourself. And as long as you're on the correct trajectory with your, with your game and your development, that's incredibly exciting to a girl or a woman. She's going to really like you for that. And even if your money isn't right and your body isn't right and your fashion isn't right and your career isn't right, you can still be attractive as long as you're doing the right things to go in the right direction. So the idea that there's no reason you're not enough, which is my essential philosophy, can occur at any time. The whole philosophy of this man of action thing is that you don't give yourself permission to have confidence or even ask and stand up for yourself when you're asking. I mean, I don't think man of action plays by the four times rule, you know, stand up for yourself sort of game. I think that's missing. And the problem is, from a business point of view, if you're asking you know, I need more training, I need to be better, make more money, better, more social media. That's a great business model. But eventually, what if the student isn't getting anywhere, right? From my business model, just comparing and contrasting, because ultimately this goes out to the the students of the world. Um, My business model is making sure that you are enough in terms of your behavior, your fashion, and your, your attitude. You know how to ask, you have low expectations, you can deal with you know, pushback that you're getting from girls if you're getting tests. And if you're insufficient as a guy, we identify that we fix that. And if you're not doing enough in terms of asking and making good plans and invitations, we identify that and fix that as well. So he looks like he's making guys into great products. I want to make guys into great at asking and great invitations and great tasteful persistence and dealing with um, people who may not realize that they might be interested in you. So that's essential game, and he's essential personal development and the glamorous side of things. There's two different segments. The business works really well, and his business is probably doing much better than mine. But what's your, you you know, you've got a bit of a negative gripe, Wimbledon. What is that? What's your kind of skepticism here? Not with him. I actually think, because, I mean, full disclosure, I I know him, and I've actually done that that program. Um, But I actually don't have a gripe with him. I have a gripe with... Some of the podcasts like um, Fresh and Fit and whatever. And I think the problem is these podcasts, what they say is is great. They're saying go to the gym, get rich, um, go get your money sorted and just be a well put together individual. Up to that point, I completely agree. The problem is, is the advice that they give after that is and then the women will come. And I Through the four-week natural program, you absolutely do not – none of us think that if we're rich, cool, and jacked, and we're sat at table in a club, none of the women are going to come flocking to us and and trying to get our number. It's just not how the world works. And I think this – there is a new movement which has become very popular, which is that mindset, which is if you build it, they will come. Um, And that's absolutely not what – I don't think any of us believe and and I I find it a shame. Um, And I think that's what the four week natural is, is good at uh, combating against where absolutely you, you are enough and you are a a very good choice for the woman to go with, but none of us expect anything, um, which is a a very bad mindset to come from. So. Yeah. That expectation uh... makes people, makes people pretty angry. Go ahead. Sorry. 
I want to I want to build on that actually. So, you know, there are other dating coaches. Uh, am I allowed to name names here? Yeah, you can. I think everyone's accountable to their work that they put out there in the world. Sure. Sure. Okay. So there are other dating coaches, like <clears throat> for example, Todd V or Steve Todd, right? Who you know talk about like power dynamics when it comes to approaching. So they're like, like, oh, you need to approach a certain way so you don't come across as low value, low power. But then, you know, that seems like it kind of discourages guys from approaching at all because, like, you know, how are you supposed to get the girl then if you don't approach her? If approaching is low value, but you don't approach, there's no win here. So what do you have to say to that? Yeah. So is that what he's saying? Is it, is it like you, you can only approach with power, otherwise you shouldn't approach at all? Is that what he's saying? Not exactly. He says more like you need to approach a certain way to uh, basically indicate that you're high value and a high power person. What is that way? Standing or yelling or something or what? Right. So that's what I'm asking you because, you know, your philosophy is you just need to go take action, right? Take that massive action, believe you're enough, and then the results will come. So my question is, and I'm sure a lot of viewers out there, they want to know, does it really... You know, do you, do you need to be thinking about these things? You need to think about being a high value person when you approach, or should you just go and do it and see where it takes you? Oh, okay. In terms of value, those value dynamics, if you can physically speak to the same person, you're in the same class of human being. So you're, you're the same value. You're both middle class or upper middle class or even, you know, uh, not lower class, but more like a blue collar class, maybe. You, if you're speaking to the same person in the same place, you're of the same class. And as a guy, our value is determined by our ambition, basically, our attitude and our ambition. So in any moment, you can have, you can have high value vibes or low value vibes. All of us guys on the call, all of the guys listening to this at any time, you can have high value vibes. So if you just remind yourself that I'm going places, I'm working on things, I've got good coaches, I'm surrounded by good people, I want the best for this girl, and I, I intend, I hope, I plan, I intend on giving the best to this girl, that's the value. You have the confidence and the ambition and the empowerment to share value with that girl. You don't need to have you know, money in the bank and abs on your belly and the best watch on your wrist or whatever to, to do that. So it's just a state of mind. And oftentimes, you know, you have these young, ambitious guys who just have a big mouth and they go and take action. They get the girl, even the girl, getting the girl gives them confidence to go and do better in their business. So anything that pollutes um, a guy's ability to take action or his, his mindset to take some action is just bad news. And I'll admit guys like, you know, the, the RSD guys like Tyler and Jeffy and even Julian, they're just like, who the fuck cares about all that? Let's just fucking go. Let's just go. The, the, the new wave stuff, it's very YouTube friendly and, and advertising friendly because it doesn't talk about, you know, male and female psychology and dynamics because that's a little bit risky to speak about nowadays. But yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't think it's great. Anything that pollutes that is not good. There's no reason you're not enough to go and speak to people and wish them well and have good intentions and, and everything is possible. So it does really boil down to that. Eventually, eventually the girls might start evaluating, you know, does this guy have career prospects? Does he look after himself? Does he have friends who hold him to high standards with the way that he dresses? Uh, that's going to factor into the decision. But if, if, if you've got the ambition and the energy and the spring in your step, you can transcend all of that. By the way, uh, Canada, I'm feeling infinitely better about life after our conversation today about thinking new thoughts about health and fitness and well-being. We can talk about it in a later section of this call. Happy to help. New York, what do you think? And, and Wimbledon, what do you think? About the red, the red pill stuff. Me. Wimbledon, what is, this, what is this red pill shit exactly? I honestly don't know a lot about it. I just know that it's like guys who basically don't like girls for some reason. I've never spoken about it ever, but what is red pill? Uh, oh my God, that that topic is an hour long call in itself. Um, so to keep it really simple, um, I would, because I've been following this stuff for, for a long time. Um, I mean, I know the RSD stuff back from 15 years ago. Um, and the I would class it as 
after the, the basically RSD blew up because of the whole Julian Gate thing, what happened was that we men weren't allowed to talk about pickup on the internet anymore. Uh, I mean, it, as you said, Alex, if you start talking about it, YouTube's probably going to shut you down unless you're clever about how you speak about it. So what's emerged since then is what I would call the red pill movement. The new red pill movement is what's taken the place of now that pickup is no lang longer allowed to be talked about on the internet. And it's a series of podcasts and influencers and a new online space, which was a very different message to what pickup had. The message of pickup was, it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter your situation. We don't care. Go take action. And that's the philosophy I really like. And I believe that's the philosophy that the four-week natural really embodies. But this new red pill movement, what I'm saying is they've got a whole different philosophy, which I, I don't think is helpful to guys. Uh, so and, what is uh, the building on that, that, that girls suck or something? That girls are not good or something? Just building what on you... what he just said. Yeah. Uh, so, well, to answer your question then also, because I'm very familiar with the red pill as well. I've read Rolo's book, Rolo Tomasi. He's like the red pill godfather, so to speak. Uh, he wrote this book called The Rational Male, which, you know, some of it's good. A lot of it's shit. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but it's true. Um, <laughs> Everyone's entitled to an opinion in a free world. Yeah, sure. Right. So he and other people in the red pill will espouse the view that I was just uh, asking you about earlier, which is, is it low, low value to approach? You know, because like a girl is going to look down. They basically say a girl is going to look down on you if you approach her because you're the one who's being needy by going to talk to her. Do you think that's true? Of course not. Of course not. I mean, all of us, all of us guys, sometimes we get approached by like homeless people, for example, yeah, right? Okay. Or you get approached by somebody on a bus or a train and you think they're kind of dumb, right? You're like, oh, this dumb person is talking to me. They've approached me, started a conversation. But we've all had the experience where somebody will approach you and they, they're they talking and they're funny or they're telling a good story. Or even though they're a bit goofy or unkempt, they've actually got a good idea or a good suggestion. You're like, shit, you didn't look like much to begin with, but you're actually great. And it, these kind of girls or this kind of culture that you're talking about, maybe young, naive girls who don't know any better, they um, they might have been led to believe that no one who approaches them could possibly be good because it's very, very rare. But a, a strong guy with a strong personality who's curious about a girl that he wants to meet, he can go and speak to her, polite, sorry to interrupt, um, but the guy needs to come with a plan and an intention and an awareness of how he's affecting the girl. And then he can get through to her and be a great conversational host. He starts the conversation. Therefore, he's the host. The lady is the guest. The girl is the guest. And it's really nice to take a guest role if you're the girl, if you've got a good host coming along. So it's complete bullshit. And also, I think, you know, fear sells and fear gets more clicks. It's, uh, so it sounds pretty bad. M my understanding of Red Pill, my understanding of Red Pill is that it's that girls are not to be trusted it's kind of like this college image that i have in my head like girls are not to be trusted girls are only going to cheat on you girls are going to let you down um don't waste your time energy and effort on girls and women that's my understanding is that correct uh new york and new york's in a fucking hostel and he's that, that's off. also my understanding by the way but i'm also not really into the community it's just from the memes that people i have two or three friends that are really into it and they always send me these memes and from that, I, I always get that impression. It's like girls are basically these creatures that will just use you for your money and your status. And then they will monkey branch or whatever they call it to the next best guy. And uh, Monkey swing to the next best guy. <laughs> yeah, and then they, they leave you behind. I think that's what the memes always say. And I, I think it's so stupid because it puts you into this negative mindset and this mindset where you're basically a victim and you can't do anything about it. So focus on yourself. Or I think even some of the memes always say focus on yourself, King. You know, it's like just focus on yourself, go to the gym, do go to the gym, make money. And then eventually some girl will come to you, but she will never be yours. She might just leave you for somebody else. So don't worry about it. Rather than having a positive attitude about the world and about people and about life. So I think it's a, a very negative mindset and a very negative 
perspective to come from. Yeah, okay, okay. So, yeah, anything else to add to clarify what red pill is? I'll just give my, I've never given my thoughts on it, but I, but I will now because I'd love to, you know, again, this is what we do is we, we help guys to transform their lives and their mindsets and their behavior set to, to take control of their dating life and be confident and not worry about this shit ever again. So I want to understand this and then try to send a message out to anybody who was once red pill. And I know that New York was when he came in from East Coast USA. He's like, I'm worried about women and what if they're, what if I'm a, what's a simp? What if they think I'm a simp? And we had all those conversations. Anything else to add? Canada, Simon, Wimbledon about this red pill shit? And then I, I want to give a, a, a sermon on it. I have a couple of thoughts on it. I think you just, whatever you believe, you're going to see either way. And if you just believe that and you're like some of these red pill guys that I've, I've crossed paths with, that's all they're listening to. They're listening to podcasts about it. It's like a 24 seven record player in their head. That's always happening. And so when they see girls or other things, it's all their, you know, you kind of, you are what you think. And if that's all you, all you are, then you're just going to see more evidence of that because you're not yeah, it's just as information so, bias basically. Exactly. Con confirmation bias. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. Yeah. For the, for the red pill guys, this is going to be applying to, you know, mostly guys who are under 25. I just want to say, if you're a guy and you're under 25 and you've got this red pill thinking, expect it, expect that girls are going to date around, expect that girls are going to want to live their best life up until a certain point. Dating like girls under the age of 24, they want to date and have a whole lot of rich experiences, right? Make the most of that, that phase in their life for sure. Great. And at the same time, you're going to get a piece of the action as a guy. You know, if you, if you go to the gym, you study hard, you dress half well, you make an effort to smile and stand up straight and you actually ask these girls, stand up for yourself, you're going to get a piece of the action. But that action is going to be shifting and then you're going to get a different girlfriend and then that girl might go and date a different guy because he's funny or adventurous or more chill or whatever it's going to be. It's a, it's just a, an economy of dating. Accept it, get over it. And they're allowed to look for something better in the same way that you are allowed to look for something better. And while everybody is continuing to grow and evolve personally, your standards will raise. And then what you're looking for in a partner is going to raise. So as a guy, if you keep raising your standards, you can keep raising your partner standards or even ask, your one partner to raise their standards and maybe you grow together. So up until the age of like 24, 25, people generally don't want to get married to the audiences that we talk to, the demographics that we talk to. Um, so just expect it, suck it up. Don't be negative. Don't call it red pill and don't turn this into Darth Vader hate shit. Take it on the chin, take a fucking heartbreak. I had a heartbreak recently and it's not, you know, I'm not red pill and it just sucks. And then you change your standards and you raise your standards. Don't get angry about it. They're allowed to do that. It's a dating economy. But I can tell you right now, I know Canada personally and Simon personally and Munich and, and Wimbledon and the girls who've dated these guys and, and myself, once you, you know, red pill, like recovering red pill person, once you become the kind of the heroic version of yourself and you know who you are, what you want to do, and it's clear that other girls would be attracted to you if they had the chance at you, then you don't need to worry about girls being disloyal again. Once they're invested in you, they're loyal to you and you're good to go. And if they, if a girl fears losing you because you're an ambitious guy, you're working hard, you don't need to worry about losing your girl unless you're super insecure and self-destructive. So it's not a thing for, for those 5%, 4% of guys who are truly alpha, it's not a thing that you need to worry about. It's funny, New York, your, uh, your avatar with all the girls around you keeps popping up before your little <laughs> your little <laughs> emoji avatar thing. Um, so don't, Red Pill guys, get the fuck over it. Girls are allowed to date around. Keep working on yourself. It, it's It's a dating economy. It goes back and forth. You'll have your wins, you'll have your losses, you'll get your piece of the pie. And if you're not getting any of the piece of your pie, it's because you're not asking, you're not playing by the rules of society, you're not going to the gym, you're not even trying to be ambitious, you've already given up and you've got your fucking yourself to blame. But podcasts like this and YouTube channels like this who speak on the positive side of things will get you there. We have a factory of changing lives every fucking month. So fuck your red pill and come to the four-week natural pill. Or, or, come, or just read yeah. some, some podcasts. Sorry. Yeah, Anything so to add on that? Very, 
Well, I have a question because we've been talking about this development uh, that might be a little bit less positive in some uh, perspectives. But um, I'm curious on the other side, have you seen like any positive breakthroughs or things you figured out during the events um, about, for example, interaction with women that you recently came up with that might help the guys that are running your programs? Actually, yeah, good segue, Simon. Good segue, moving things along. Um, I've got a really good idea about how women categorize men and how it's really easy to train guys to understand that, to change that. But anything else to, to conclude on the red pill? Because I'm the good thing is, especially you in New York, you're 28, right? 27. Oh, 27. I'm, I'm 39 now. So you're more in that generation, that demographic. Oh, Wimbledon, good background. You've got to change your perspective. Get the horizontal background. Um, any other red pill thoughts? What, what are your guys' thoughts on the red pill stuff? You don't even need to worry about it, really. Yeah, so this might have been touched on while I was out, so I apologize if it's being asked again. But in terms of just like dealing with jealousy, what do you have to say to guys who struggle with that? Guys who are jealous? Uh, guys, guys who get jealous, jealous of yeah, so like, yeah. Good question, good question. And Simon, I've got your question in mind. Um, with guys who are jealous, jealous, if... If the girl has justification to look at another guy, it's because you're not doing enough as a guy in your life and you're not growing fast enough. You, you don't have bright enough ambitions. You're being too negative as a person. I think, you know, we, we can't control our partners. We don't control them. We don't entrap them. We don't enslave them. So if your partner starts to become curious about other guys that kind of keeps you honest and keeps you um keeps you living up to your standards going to the gym being smart with your your wealth treating your girl really really well making time for her responding to her well um being strong to with her when you need to be strong with her um and i think if she's going to go and talk to another guy or entertain ideas and the attention of another guy she's an idiot. I'm not jealous. She's being an idiot. And if she's going to be an idiot, I'm going to go find, I'm going to find a better girl for myself or I'm dropping the ball. And I think shit, my partner or my girlfriend is talking to a different guys. We're not giving him as much attention. You start the conversation with your girlfriend. And you say, look, I feel like I'm not living up to a couple of standards. I could be wrong. I'm going to be vulnerable here for a second. I feel like I'm not, lighting your world on fire the way that I, I could or that I used to. And I I wanna I wanna know what what do you think comes next to me? What could make me a better man in, in different ways? What would be exciting for you? And so you have that conversation and you kind of you can do what she's asking for for the most part. So jealousy is a great equalizer. If you had a staff member and the staff member wants to leave your company because you're treating them badly or you're not doing enough or the staff member doesn't believe in your company, it makes sense for the staff member to leave. So jealousy is a good equalizer and we can't control people. It's like, yeah, you just have to have faith in the person that they're going to be normal and you need to keep your standards high and keep raising them all throughout your life. Just keep growing. So hopefully, hopefully that's a pretty comprehensive answer. Absolutely. Control what you can control. Yeah. Other red pill stuff, Munich, any questions? You're, you're, you're super smart with game and girls, man. So I want to, I want to uh, get more input from you. No, I don't really have any further comments on it. I feel like I don't know enough about the red pill stuff to have an in-depth comment. I just think what I already said before that it leads to too much self-victimization instead of taking action. Precisely. Yeah, sure. And and, yeah, and, and I think. To go to these podcasts that you see, they're just super catchy. You know, when you see these reels on Instagram where there's like some girl that's on a podcast and she's saying some really dumb shit. And <laughs> yeah, of course, people will watch that and laugh about it. But I think the setup of that is just so unfair. It's like these old school talk shows. It's get some girl on there to talk about some topic that she has no clue about. The girl is doesn't even know what she's going to talk about. She's just there because she needs followers to promote her OnlyFans. And then they purposefully make her say dumb shit, basically. And I don't know. I don't like the whole industry, but it is what it is. Exactly. Yeah. 
It's, uh, it sucks that it exists, but it gets clicks and it probably drives business somewhere. To your question, Simon, um, have I had new epiphanies on programs recently um, that has helped with the students? Yeah, and I'm, my next video blog is going to be about this. We've got our, our video editor down here in the bottom. Actually, my video editor is from, uh, from Bulgaria. And one of the reasons why I hired him is because he guaranteed me that if I hired him, I can visit him in Bulgaria and sleep with a lot of Bulgarian girls. So it's, a, it's great. I went out there to Bulgaria. I met him. We went go-karting, drank some beer. He took me to the local nightclub, got me hooked up. So thanks again, video editor. I'm coming back out to Bulgaria again soon, man. Thank you. He's just listening in the background. And he keeps on putting naked chicks in the fucking videos. We need to edit them out. It does get clicks still in. Stop putting, stop putting half-naked chicks in the fucking videos. Um, yes, so what I was explaining to the students, Stellian, this is just because I referenced naked chicks in the conversation, don't edit it into the video. Got it? Good, it's just a black box at the bottom, at the bottom of the screen here. Um, with, with the conversation, I want, my, I want the students on the, the program to know that when they meet a girl or a woman for the first time, and I think about you know the guys in Croatia, um, especially the, the Latvian guy or maybe the Slovenian guy who are a little bit nervous types of guys. <laughs> Stelian messages the chat, looking up the naked clips. Um, I think of these more nervous guys. And when, when a girl meets a guy for the first time, she immediately categorizes the guy in one of four ways. She's trying to figure out what kind of guy is this going to be? And the girl only, I mean, women and girls are going to be polite to everybody because they're conflict avoidant, which presents as friendly and agreeable. And then what excites them are guys who fall into certain types of categories. And if you don't fall into the exciting categories, you basically fall into two non-eventful categories. So the four categories that the girls have immediately evaluate you as are number one is the one night stand kind of guy and Munich over here with his uh, German girlfriends in the background there and a couple of guys Munich here in the background in on the call here he, he's tall he's got tattoos he dresses in designer hoodies his fashion is on point what do you call your fashion like this big white t-shirt fashion and the short shorts and the socks there's a name for it it's like a modern thing it's not traditional. Ask to unmute. Unmute Munich. You are on mute. Yeah, sorry, I was having a bit of a connection issue. Can you say it again? Yeah, what do you what do you call that fashion that you have with these like big white t-shirts? Oh yeah. Um I would just call it street style. At least that's what we call it in Germany, but 2024 street style with the big shirts. It's it's its own unique like millennial or it's like a Gen Z male look and people love it. And I get it. It's uh, a bit different to the traditional like collar shirt. So, so this guy falls into that category. One, I stand guy. Then there's like this kind of provider, like eligible bachelor type. And I think, you know, the guys on the call here, uh, Wimbledon and Canada, myself as well, we're more like the boyfriend type, like alpha type guy with options, very eligible bachelor. Type number three and four. Number three is like the gay best friend. Energetic, playful, entertaining, chatty, but she doesn't worry about hooking up with that guy. And then there's the non-event guy, just boring, uh, whatever, nice to meet you, fuck off, right? So the thing is, when I when I explain it to students, I, I, I want them to be the alpha type of guy, the guy who's like the boyfriend type or the interesting type. And it's almost impossible to become that lover, that one night stand kind of guy, because you need to have the tattoos, the looks, the fashion, the relaxation, the directness, be in touch with your sexuality. And that's really where I want you guys to get on Four Week Natural. And I think, um, yeah, actually everyone here on this call, Munich, Canada, New York, and Wimbledon, you all had that by the end of it. I mean, do you remember Wimbledon? We're going to like infernos and you're just rolling around, like very in touch with your sexuality and sharing your, your happiness of sexuality with the people that you're talking to. Canada is in fucking Thailand. We're out there and he's meeting, he's falling in love with these beautiful exotic girls. <laughs> Chicago, I mean, <laughs> New York over here was in London. And he's like, I'm allowed to enjoy the process. I'm allowed to 
ask girls to hang out with me, have a drink, come to my house. I'm allowed to do that. That now I can't, I don't know what's going to happen, but you guys all got in touch with that. And girls would take a look at you with your geeky glasses, Mr. New York, or your fat belly, Mr. Wimbledon, or your, you had a bad haircut in Thailand, Canada, <laughs> tall, blonde, athletic guy. Um, and the girls would be like, oh, he is a fucking guy. Maybe he's just like a, generally, because we all don't look like flamboyant. They look at you like you're a non-event, like just a regular showed guy. And then you keep talking. You've got plenty to say. You use a range of emotions. You're physically expressive. And they think, shit, this guy could be the boyfriend type. And then we add intent. I want to I want to drink with you. I want to dance with you. I want to do something with you. Come to our summoning event. Come and party with our friends. And then we add the personalization, which has been a big epiphany. Telling the students to add the personalization. I think you're um, excited to talk to. I think you're so exotic. I think you're way smarter than all the other people here. When you add that, then she thinks, shit, this is exciting. And especially, you know, if you're at a nightclub or a party island like Koh Samui or Havar, the girls think, ha, huh, Canada slots into one night stand category. But then she has to get over her own nervousness and is, is she going to commit or not commit, all that kind of stuff. And so when I explain it to a student, what kind of student are you going to be? If you don't do anything, you're going to be the non-event guy. If you're all playful and friendly and trying to rapport, you're basically going to be the gay best friend. And you know, our man, Dean, he was a bit like that, but then he calmed it down, got his rhythm right, moved things forward, and it became the boyfriend type. And now pretty much all of us do that well. I think Wimbledon, your boyfriend type, everywhere, Canada, boyfriend type. And then New York, you're like hostel mode 27, traveling the world you're like one night stand or nothing <laughs> let's party tonight and i don't even know what i'm doing tomorrow i can't even charge my phone so it's absolutely right right so it's and when we learn game uh people think my ex-girlfriend used to think like you're you're learning game to manipulate people you learn game to show that you have an ability to express yourself in a way that's not just a normal boring guy that you're in that certain category and the girl lines you up ah this guy, the potential of this guy is only going to be intimate, fun, and exciting. He's not going to be the boring type of guy. So he's in that category. Now I relate to him in that category. Do you remember for all of you guys, like when we invite people to our summoning parties, the girls change immediately. Like you have an invitation. You, you've got this event. You've got a boat. We had 96 bottles of champagne for this party. I have a deal with the supplier over there. It was brilliant. Um, and then the whole demeanor of the girl changes and in your case fucking munich it's a pity i can't show you photos of this guy he like the girls would fight for him because they're so sure that every other girl is going to want his attention and they do and they'll text him and they'll chase him to his house and they'll walk to his apartment it happens to everyone here on this call to a certain extent except me because i'm been dating so much recently being in a long relationship but that's the the lesson. Like what kind of category are you in? And categorization and what category are you in? Once you get that, then you can adjust it accordingly and you can understand the female psychology to work with it and to be the kind of boyfriend type of guy that we all want to be in, in the industry. And I think, you know, Simon helps here with helping guys uh, understand the program. And we explain to the pro to the guys who are, you know, calling up and doing the discovery calls, what you learn on Four Week Natural is that You'll, you'll go from being the guy who doesn't know how to express himself and be risky and be personal and direct. And when you can change that, when I can take you through that and overcome your problems and make you become that guy, you're the attractive boyfriend guy who creates fear of loss with everybody. And that's what it is to be a natural. If you zoom in on my little red, my little red logo here, that's what four week natural is. So that's and, the uh... epiphany there, Simon. Go ahead, New York. Alex, I wanted to touch upon what you said about game and manipulation. So as you mentioned, I'm staying in a hostel right now in Warsaw. And yesterday I had a lovely conversation with two guys. One was really into talking about game. You know, he participates. Sounds like he's very successful. Great guy. Really cool Was that guy. the tattoo guy? That was the tattoo guy. He actually yeah. might be here. I'm not sure. In yeah. any case, uh, the other guy was this Dutch guy. Also really cool. Excellent guitarist. But he had, it sounds like, some bad experiences with RSD, where he was very skeptical uh, of me talking about game yesterday. And he alluded to it as basically manipulation. 
So what do you what do you say to people who say that game is just manipulation? I had this yeah great question. I had this uh my ex-girlfriend who's very progressive, very woke, English um English girl and you know they're as progressive as it gets, very very woke, LGBTQ friendly, all that kind of stuff. And if people when they hear about, you know, guys learning how to do things to be better in the field of dating, they assume that is to take a guy who's normal and make him have a superpower or a special advantage. The answer to that is that where anyone that we're training in quote unquote game is to overcome insufficiencies or, or deficiencies in your personality or a lack of personality. So imagine to be normal is zero is a score of zero. Everyone here is less than perfect. You're lacking manners, lacking expression, lacking an ability to connect, lacking an ability to be charming or friendly or playful or show boundaries. So my goal in training people in game is taking people from being not good at being social to being normal at being social and being able to ask. So there's no superpower at game. There's no special skill. It's about going from being broken to very, very whole. There's no extra things. But I think, you know, so, for example, if, if all of us, we want to go on an airplane, we're not looking for a super-powered airplane to fly from, you know, in your case, from New York to, to Europe. We're not looking for a super plane with, you know, fucking jet boosters and some super shit. We're looking for the, the company that has all of the little details best put together. And we think that's a super airline, right? Whereas if you go with some shit airline, like this is broken and this is delayed and this has shit customer service and the seats suck, I'm teaching everyone to make sure that every single detail that they can control is under control. And then they are such a great package. They stand out so much better than any other guy. So you become a really solid guy compared to every other guy. You're, you're not a super guy. So there's no manipulation at all. You, to, in order to manipulate, you have to be uh, better, than a, better than a Hollywood actor. What about like, you know, the industry loves to talk about pickup lines though. And when, you know, the average person hears pickup line, they think, oh, manipulation oh you're trying to say something to push a button someone else it's just sleep easy what do you think about that it's like asking it's like a computer from 20 years ago trying to have a conversation with a computer from today it doesn't make any sense you guys want to answer that one i don't i uh wimbledon yeah, or... i have some i have some thoughts on this one i think sure. uh, in my that experience pick up line, creepy is... pickup lines yeah yeah, if you, the, the thing is, if you have a pickup line, it takes away from your own authenticity. And also it takes away like the genuine conversation you can have with the girl. Like my rule for myself was always when I walk up to somebody and I start a conversation, I don't think about it. And I'll just see what comes up when I stand in front of her. Well, sometimes it pays, uh, it pays up and pays back very well. Sometimes it doesn't. But it means that I'm actually myself talking to this girl and then the conversation becomes very genuine. Nice. Yeah. Not nicely said. And it's a great way to think about it as well with, with pickup lines. They don't, there's no such thing as pickup lines, uh, Munich and, and, uh, Wimbledon, you guys want to ask anything you guys want to contribute to the manipulation of pickup lines. I'll give it an answer. I did a podcast, a blog on this recently. Uh, I think the, the most funny that. thing that I, I see you do actually the opposite of, of a pickup line is what you do is, and I think that is one of the things that everyone learned from you in the last 15, 20 years. I don't know how long you've been doing this, but is how you just come up with the most random stuff, but there's usually relating to something that's happening right now or that the girls are doing, right? Or that your, your client is doing in relation to the girl. So you will just whisper something in there. You go to this girl and say, like whatever, like I, I can't even come up with an idea or with a memory right now. Or maybe you will say something. What was it? One time we were walking next to this bar and there were these bubbles flying around in the air and you were just go tell these girls something like with every bubble that flies here will make one of your dreams come true. You know, you just come up with this random stuff and this is really what, what I think yeah, what yeah, it is yeah. about instead of having these pickup lines, having the ability to flow, flow freely from the things that are happening around you, the things that you perceive, the things that happen, um, the things that you notice about the girl, her <laughs> group, something that you see and then having a way to make it funny. 
that is something that you excel at and that I think to a certain extent, we all learn from you. Sure, sure, sure. Um, with, okay, so with pickup lines and when I'm on the program, when I'm with Munich over here, is it Munich? Yeah, it's your fucking alias. The pickup line that you're referring to, like mainstream being the voice of, you know, skepticism here, New York, is, you know, like, hey, are you an angel? You fell from heaven or some shit like that. Or, you know, it's just crap. But when I say to when I say to Munich, we we're in Croatia, I'm like, there's a girl. Here's a suggestion, a conversation and starting suggestion. Here's the algorithm that goes through my head. There's some bubbles. And I'm thinking, we need to say something dumb to break the ice, but it has to be relevant to here and now. And it has to be relevant to, you know, guys meeting girls, it has to be a bit romantic. And when we say something silly, a bit playful and risking embarrassing ourselves. When we do that, we demonstrate to the girl that we do not have fear of being judged. We're not even trying to be funny. We're just trying, we don't have any fear of being judged. We're tasteful with our humor. And we anticipate that you're going to challenge us back and we can handle that challenge. That is high value behavior. That is a demonstration of BHV, a, a high value behavior, because you can endure judgment and survive, keep the conversation going. The girl thinks, shit, this guy doesn't care if he fucks up because he doesn't care, that's the guy I want attention from. Every other guy is coming across safe and energetic and boring conversation. And so when you go over and say, hey, see those bubbles? Every one of those bubbles is me making one of your wish come true. <laughs> and the girl is like, what the fuck are you fucking talking about? It's like, that's right. Now I'm having a long conversation with you. That's the second bubble coming true. I'm still standing here, the third bubble coming true. And then, you know, you go into the normal stack. Hey, what's up? My name's Munich. I'm here with my friends, blah, blah, blah. So that's the real algorithm of pickup lines. And I remember Tyler in RSD, he's like, Alex, dude, dude, how does your mind actually work? And I'm like, it's basically like a, like a water fountain of emojis, of all different emojis flying out all of the time. And they just take different forms and I can apply them to different things. So I just got this stupid waterfall of emojis in my head. There's a stack of fun. And of course, I, we, we don't care about judgment because what is there to be judged by? We can't control people. So we can't worry if they judge us or not, as long as they're being tasteful and we're thinking win-win. Anyway, so there, there's that point. One of the, I want to turn the attention back now to some more like fun or heroic stories. Um, any other questions or talking points from you guys? And then I want to hear some, I want to reminisce on the London adventure, uh, Wimbledon, when we did our program in 2021, if you can remember some epic times. Or, but any other questions about pickup lines or anything so far? Even Canada, what's been going on? You've been a bit quiet over there, but I haven't thrown to you very much. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of some crazy, I mean, in Thailand, there was so many that we had. I mean, the motorcycle was one thing going up that driveway. Uh, that oh, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That so when you're action. bringing girls on your motorcycle back up like a 500 foot ascent in the rain with snakes and buffaloes and fucking lightning coming down <laughs> and you fell off as well yeah I fell off one or two times oh i do have a story which is we were roommates in thailand mm -hmm. and there was a night where i brought a girl back and there we had this infinity pool it was amazing because it just looked over the entire koh Samui. And it was a pretty uh, pretty nice night, but it's probably like four or five in the morning at this point. And we're sitting out by the infinity pool. And she says, she gets a call from this guy. And the guy is like a Russian guy. And I hear the conversation. He says, where are you? And she's like, I don't know. Where are you? So she hangs up. He calls back again. And then it turns out he's, um, he keeps saying, where are you? And we hear on the speaker phone that there's some noise of like a chicken or some like domesticated animal. And then we hear <laughs> that noise. Of course, a chicken now. in Thailand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then we hear uh, that same noise that's down below, uh, just by the mountain, meaning <clears throat> that he's nearby. So he basically followed her coordinates on Snapchat to where she was located, drove up the mountain, and he was right outside of the apartment at like four or five in the morning and this guy was like furious so then i said to the girl you have to go right now so i closed the door <laughs> and you have to leave now and then i hear him literally right outside of the complex but he didn't know which one it was and uh they were like arguing with each other that that was the last i saw of her 
<laughs> it's it's like battlefield earth doing doing program in thailand it's brilliant <laughs> do you remember you remember i was talking about that guy ray uh wimbledon i was talking about um this guy ray we were in thailand and we were doing the summoning or just before the summoning and there's this beautiful russian girl she was like really well put together quite a huge chest almost no english and everyone in the program went over and speaks to this beautiful russian girl elegant summer dress whatever and then this guy ray he's kind of short he's filipino australian he is kind of like he's not the most coherent speaker but he parties like a like he's the number one party guy ever and he brings the community together so much i remember i was like driving on our driveway home at about four o'clock in the night and then i just see him walking along the side of this road with the same russian girl that everyone had got rejected by that night on the way up to a mountain somewhere, just in the middle of nowhere, like with buffaloes and snakes and chickens and shit. And then he hooks up with her and it looks so weird. Cause he's like, it doesn't look like Captain America and she looks like a fucking supermodel and off they go and they fall in love. And then they got flowers and all this crazy shit going on. And Ray is like, yeah, it's just a normal day. Yeah. <laughs> Wimbledon was like, how could you go to the, the, sh the shooting, the gun range the same time as these guys because these guys they're literally out of their minds it's brilliant they're, they're great you'll meet them if you join the community ray and uh part of <laughs> these are wild guys let's talk about london yeah so yeah stories funny from enough from i just Wimbledon. like last weekend i <laughs> i was going through some old videos on my phone and i saw a pretty funny video of mr wimbledon here stumbling I was inside some place getting food and Mr. Wimbledon just stumbling past, blackout drunk. <laughs> <laughs> when we were at this Infernos, oh my God. Yeah. Infernos, yeah, God, Infernos. And I have that to night he ended up <laughs> pulling some girl and he couldn't even walk anymore. I have to tell the stories of uh, Uncle Gupta, you know, our 53-year-old Indian friend from the community in uh, in London. But actually, uh, Wimbledon, do you have any stories about, about London, good stories that you remember from your event, about the firefighter, about our Scottish friend, about, about anything? Can you remember? Or can you tell the stories about Uncle Gupta, which is, um, if you can remember, sounds like Carlos is his real name. So I, to, to echo back to one of the previous questions, the reason I did the four-week natural is because I'd just come out of a six-year, very abusive relationship and i think that question about manipulation is the premise is that we have all the power and actually i came out of that relationship and and i had none of the power actually sometimes women have a lot of the power when it comes to the relationship mm -hmm. so i did four week natural and we have like an a get a grade group of guys like there's this one absolute adonis blue-eyed mm -hmm. firefighter um and then there's a, who's still a really good friend of mine dr gupta whatever you want to call him um who <laughs> Uncle is, Gupta. <laughs> it, it, he's like five foot eight like really like kind of um eccentric um guy so so the i i think i just ended up having the time of my life because i think me and alex like i was paying alex to be a coach but i think halfway through he realized like i was just there for a laugh um and i was just having the time of my life i mean i probably became a, a bit of an alcoholic from that month uh and the last, on London. the last night, yeah, on the last night, um, so I'd won the medallion, which is a, a kind of prize that Alex gives to the, the best student. And I was just like, right, tonight I'm not even gaming. I'm just going to have a good time and drink. And I'd been drinking before I met the guys for about five hours in the pub because I was watching the football with the boys. So I arrive to the night out already drunk. We get into Infernos and I tear the place apart. I, I was buying everyone drinks. I didn't care. Alex, I, I must have put through hundreds and hundreds of pounds through the bar buying Alex shots because I was persuading Alex to drink. Was that so, the last night as well? That, that was the last night. I think it was. I, I mean, it's hard to remember at this point. But I, remember, I remember at that point, I was thinking this guy, Wimbledon, he's doing so well. You know, you're a paid student. I need to, I need to just, you know, bring my A game, so to speak. I need to commit. I need to embrace. And I'm still like a generation older than you running around the club. And I'm going like dancing with everyone. I'm, my, my party move is to put everyone on my shoulders. 
So I'm just getting every girl on my shoulders, bringing them over to you, saying hello. It was br- it was an absolute fucking blast, man. Continue, sorry. No, but that was crazy to see you really going for it. I was like, holy crap, when this guy turns it on, this is a whole different level. Because your focus on the program is mainly on the students. But then since that, I mean, we've actually been going out kind of together, you know, in Vegas and in Havara, you know, we kind of... Um, Vegas you, was so good, that pool party. We're just surrounded by these New York girls with the blonde hair. Oh, Brilliant. My, oh my God, we need... To, that's another podcast, but I mean... Geez, and, and the that, night before, when we just... we Like, you and I just went in there, like the men in black, we know what to do, how to scream, what to ask for, how to move, done, done. And we just back to the hotel room straight away. Yeah, Brilliant. and I was winging... I was winging you, and we went up to the hotel room, and, you know, you taught me the trick about going behind the curtain it was that, that <laughs> i don't think we can talk about that otherwise it's going to get taken off whatever channel you put this on but needless to say it was a hilarious <laughs> night but on the last night of london mr munich was absolutely mvp because i was so drunk um i was gaming this girl and we're getting a taxi back to mr munich's hotel and i actually pass out in the taxi mr munich starts gaming my girl for me while she's in the back of the taxi, while I then recover, wake up, he then lends me his hotel room and I managed to read a verse of the Bible with this girl in his hotel room. How the fuck do you come up with read a verse of the Bible? Where does this terminology <laughs> come from? Read a verse, consummate the interaction. <laughs> what Wait, do you want me to say? What do you mean? <laughs> that's that's exactly what he's been doing in there. Get the get the Gideon's Bible out and just while you're undressing, just go through fucking Psalms chapter nine, verse five or something. Like read a verse of the Bible. Very good. Yeah. Do it in yeah. the name of God. Read a verse. Continue. Sorry. <laughs> in the beginning, there was the word and the word was with take your clothes off. No, but um, uh, so anyway, um, that that was probably the, the great end of, of uh, that that four week natural. And I think. We're, I'm still friends with with most of those guys today, and we have a London sort of real real group. And um, it, honestly, I look back on it and go, that was that was probably the best time of my life. And then um, the, the what's interesting though is that it's such an intense month, but then it's like going on a, on a boot camp before a fight. You can then tap back into that, like when I meet up with you guys in in Vegas or when we go to Havar or wherever. Um, I kind of tap tap back into that energy, which is is interesting. Um, so yeah, that that's our stories from from London, really. That Uncle Gupta story that I'm referring to. Were you there when the pint incident happened? I was, and yeah, I don't know <laughs> if if you want me to to tap into that, but I'll I'll it's... tell that one. And then the thing is, because like Uncle Gupta, right, Indian guy, and he done he done this other program called Project Rockstar which costs like $25,000 and Project Rockstar makes you do like this ayahuasca ceremony. And it said that it really fucked him up. And this guy, he's an, yeah, he's an Indian guy living in London, which is not unusual, but people were more racist in the nineties and the eighties when he was growing up. So he, this guy's like coming off the back of, you know, probably 30 years of adult marginalization for being an Indian guy. It's not so relevant now, you know, in the 2000s and 2024 or whatever, but Anyway, he's got that kind of built up. So we're, we're you're having so much fun at some of these clubs, uh, like fucking Simmons or whatever. And I remember Uncle Gupta, who was a student at the time and a colleague of yours and still a really good friend of ours now. I want him to come on the next podcast because he, he he can fucking talk this guy. Um, he was having a chat to a girl. She was wearing his glasses. He thought she knocked a water onto me and he snapped like 30 years of, girls maybe not being nice to him he snapped because she accidentally knocked the water onto me and i was covered in water and he's like fuck it i'm gonna stand up for alex and he he gets an entire pint and pours an entire pint of beer on this girl's this poor girl's head <laughs> now, i saw the whole thing happening and she was wearing his glasses and she was like stealing his glasses and there was an argument because she wanted to pay for his drink but he thought that she was saying that she's not going to pay for the drink and steal the drink. And then she knocked the thing at the same time. So he he thought that she did three bad things at once. And especially towards me. And he's like, fuck this. Pour the water on her head, this poor girl and all of his rage. And then I come over and, and the security guard, the security guard's like, was she being racist? 
like the security guy just like somehow points at me. It's like, was she being racist? I'm like, what the fuck? I don't know. And he, the security guy just nods his head and then takes her away. I go out there. I settle the whole thing. We we get her glasses back and all this kind of stuff. And I calm the guy down. I'm like, dude, you're kind of in the wrong there. You don't want to be fucking pouring pints. I've never seen that in my fucking life. A week later, where the same guy is in Inferno's and I don't know what he's got. He's got like fucking magic in his shoes or something. 50 years old. He's got a beard. He's got gray hair, but he's got my makeover. Like he's got my new style and my new fashion on. And this beautiful, like a curvy, lovely, athletic, like 20 year old chick has grabbed Uncle Gupta. And he's just like, she's just making out with him all over him. It's like a fucking dream come true for the guy. Happy we were days. In awe. We were like, unbelievable. Because like, Gupta, yeah. Dr. Gupta, he, he, you know, he really applied himself, but he did get some pretty tough blowouts during that mantra. I, I think even he would admit that. But then the yes. last, I think that was on the last day, he was in Inferno's with some absolute smoke show, making yeah. out with her in the middle of the club. We were all like, oh my God, it was unbelievable. <laughs> you know what I said? Like in his case, so many girls would just look at him and categorize him as he's not the gay friend. He's not the lover. He's not the boyfriend. He's a nothing. And he would still keep talking, but because people are short-sighted or small-minded, they would just categorize him as nothing. And he's dealing with this shit all the time. Then all of a sudden something snaps in students and they think, I don't care. I'm going to be extroverted. I'm still going to tell people how I feel. I'm going to personalize things in my conversation. And then all of a sudden the categorizing, categorization changes and that's empowered, especially for nervous types of guys. It's like, shit, he's a nervous guy who's having the, the night of his life, who's feeling really really good he's so fun to be around and uh, something happens in that female psychology she thinks i'm gonna make a move on this guy i'm gonna kiss this guy and even my friends are gonna be shocked it's gonna be a thrill it was wild to see i don't think they went home together they uh they kind of separated later in the night um not that that's the be all and end all but it was it was really cool it's fun crazy exciting stuff happens and of all the podcasts i don't hear like a lot of the stories about what's happening on the front lines We'll start to wrap it up. We'll start to wrap it up here, guys. Maybe one more talking point. And there's plenty more podcasts to come after this anyway. And remember, a lot of this is going to go out in audio format rather than just me talking to some fucking Pokemon or whatever you guys are. Pokemon or Teletubby heads. <laughs> anyway, um, Simon, do you want to bring up another talking point or even Canada? Any talking points? Yeah, I, I actually have an interesting point we can uh, dive into. A lot of the guys that I talk to on, on the calls, they uh, just came out of a relationship, are a little bit sad. They are thinking about, I need to heal a little bit first. So how do you look at that? People just coming out of relationships, getting back into it, getting over a probably very tough situation. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, Wimbledon asked you about that as well, like getting over relationships. Um, So healing. Yeah, we did have those two guys who you know, they would get out of a relationship and then their thinking is, I, I got to take action. I got to take my mind off these things. I need to go and do something. Um, and they, they call us up and they think I want to do a fucking program, but then they're, they're, they're not ready. They're not emotionally ready to do the program. Just throw it out there to you guys. Any other talking points about healing, um, about breakups, any other breakup type questions I'll go into it. Cause I just had a, a really, really painful, really, uh, very very hard breakup for me so i can talk about that happy to talk about that i've just been in previous relationships where i feel like i lost myself and i came out of that and i was you know just i didn't know who i was anymore so it was kind of a shell of my former self and that took a long time to recover from which i think is similar to yours in some ways so definitely relatable when, when you said hard to when you say hard to recover from in what way was it hard to recover from like you just felt yeah continue tell me more yeah it was it was like what tyler would talk about is sort of the poison drip in the relationship so she would like i would forget who i was because she was constantly just not berating so much but just telling you what to do um uh kind of manipulation i don't know if she was like a covert narcissist but it was just one that was it could have could have been on the borderline of an abusive relationship i really don't know but Coming out of that, it was definitely like feeling shell shocked of not knowing who I was, what my values were. Because it was you were just so meshed in with her and her personality. We were living together for like two years, so yeah, it was what tough was her age at the time? Out. 
24, 25 sort of thing. Yeah, she's probably 24, 25. She was Greek, so she was pretty hot-headed. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about this because it, I experienced it recently and I've been watching a lot of, I've just watched like seven seasons of uh, Entourage as well. So I've seen a lot of relationship dynamics, a lot of different relationship dynamics. Any other breakup talking points? I'll, I'll say a piece on this and then we'll wrap up for today. Yeah, I, I mean, we when we were in London, Alex, I mean, I kind of broke up with someone as well. And um, yeah, it'd be really good to talk about how it helps to have other dudes that like pull you out. Like Munich actually really helped me um, during Havar, like pull me out of that kind of funk. Um, mm. I mean, it wasn't te a terrible funk, but um, and I think you also said this, Alex, that kind of Mr. Mr. Munich and a few of the other guys kind of inspire you. So it'd be good to talk about how a good group of guys can get you out of that funk. Sure, sure, sure. Um, okay, first talking about breakups and the thing that comes to mind, uh, you know what you're saying there, Canada, about, you know, the girl gets manipulative or kind of controlling. And I saw that as well in your case, Wimbledon, with your partner. And she was a beautiful, dynamic blonde blue germanic girl with you know assets in all the right places absolute babe um and so was my girlfriend my girlfriend was absolutely beautiful as well and i don't want to have a conversation where we demonize girls and we say that they're manipulative or controlling but i think i i sympathize with women because with guys especially guys like you Wimbledon and me, you know, very, very strong personalities. We know what we want. Other girls would be interested in us, types of guys like us. And so from the girl's point of view, she has no control. There is no control. It's pure faith and, and hope and trust. And so she's living in a, all these girls are living in a constant state of fear. And I think, especially you, Canada, and you, you fulfill the fucking Ned Flanders, Canadian nice guy type that we all want to be really, really nice to the girls we're with, love them, look after them and, and respond to them when they're worried, but they're, they're always going to be worried because we can have other options. And what I coach on the programs is that as guys, we worry that we're never going to get laid again. And we're constantly living to never get to, to, to overcome the fear of never get laid, getting laid again. Right. That's like evolutionary girls live in the constant fear that they're not going to be important anymore or not relevant or important to somebody anymore. So they wake up in the constant fear, like what if I'm not as important today as I was yesterday? And so that starts manifesting in the behavior. And that means we need to keep our partners engaged and loved and made to feel special. So at the start of my relationships, I said to the girls, whenever you need it, I'm going to reassure you. I'll take the time. I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll reassure you because as life goes on, we're all going to need reassurance, especially if you're a girl of a dynamic, confident type of guy. So I don't want to think like, you know, your Greek girl, that she is manipulative. I think she, they're, they're driven crazy because she wants some kind of guarantee or reassurance that she'll never be hurt. It's never going to happen. And it just come, it just manifests in these silly arguments or accusations my girlfriend would get jet lagged and stay up until four o'clock in the morning and find things on YouTube in other forums of images of me from 12 years ago. And I treated my, my partner like an absolute queen. I took her around the world. I um, would reassure her anytime. And even then things that happened before we've ever met that have nothing to do with her. They're not, not even on the public internet. She hates me for that. She just wants to bring me up for that to kind of, you know, get some reassurance that I'm not running free out of control or something like that. So it's it's always it's always going to happen. I don't think it's their fault. It's just them dealing with a really tricky, <laughs> a really really tricky situation that they'd be mental to know that maybe you know the girls are always going to want them and they're always where they're going to lose us. So unfortunately, it brings out the worst in them and it can drive us apart, and and then we have a breakup. So to answer the question about the breakup and responding from the breakup, I'm really unique. I've had this job as a dating coach since I'm 21. And basically when I started, Tyler sat me down and he said, look, child, look, 20 year old boy, 
I mean, I mean, New York, you're like 27. That's so different from 20. 20 is like, I'm basically a sperm who just got legs. <laughs> um, and he's like, Alex, if you do this job and you have this social profile, you may never be able to be trusted by women ever again. You may not ever have a girlfriend. I'm like, fair enough. It's a special job that I can have here. So I accept that. So I've had a lot of these breakups where, you know, you love the person with all of your heart. You, you want to make them happy and either they leave you or you leave them. And it's like, fuck. But ultimately with every breakup, it is for the greater good. It leads you sooner to the ultimate happiness and them sooner to their ultimate happiness. I know that, you know, Canada for your girl, you're not making her happy. Wimbledon for yours, you weren't making her as happy as she could be with another guy who she could feel more reassurance with. So ultimately it's a, it's a matter of a lack of personal development for those particular partners at that stage in their, you know, youthful, undeveloped lives. They haven't grown into the level of maturity where they just have to accept that they can't control everything. They need to keep, keep the faith. They just haven't grown into that yet. Or we as guys haven't helped them to understand that or talk them into that and reassure them all the time. It fucking sucks. And then when you go through the breakup as a guy, I think you need to, you know, do your grieving. And I, I had my grieving period. I did it in Croatia. I said, look, I, you always get angry at me for no reason, for no justifiable reason, what I don't think is justifiable. And even then, in my case, my partner was saying that I need to do certain things with my business, like basically destroy my business to make her happy. But then when I destroyed my business, financially, it was catastrophic, the stress, bad for my health, fitness, whatever. So she's destroying it. And then she needs extra reassurance. And then she keeps attacking it. I'm like, enough. You're on a boat. You're out of here now. And it, like the day before I intended on marrying this girl, I knew where I was going to marry her. I had a life plan with her. And I'm like, enough. I'm not making you happy. For the greater good, we're done. And then I had a fucking meltdown at home. I grieved. So you guys go grieve. Get fucking drunk. Get drunk. Cry your eyes out. Be hysterical. Howl, moan, cry, be angry, punch a wall, whatever. And then positive distraction, ladies and gentlemen, positive fucking distraction. So go to the gym, get a personal trainer, work on your business and hang out with other people who inspire you, even if you have to pay them or you need to watch their YouTube videos or um, you want to get on a phone call or have a drink or a beer or a coffee with somebody who inspires you, even if that's your dad or your brother or whoever it might be. Positive distraction. And for these guys, Simon, who are you know really excited about doing the program, but they don't feel they're ready remind them of positive distraction. And it's not about, you know, dating and pickup is not about going out and banging 10 other girls as they used to say in the book. It's, it's about positive distraction and turning your mind onto personal development, learning new things, humility, learning from others. And what has been beautiful about being single now is that I've been on about eight dates since then, because I do have the best dating app. I'm the, the world's leading dating app profile coach. Um, so you just go out and it's so fun meeting all these different people and you, you don't fall in love with the next eight people that you're going to date and you might not sleep with or be attracted to the next eight people that you date. But it's so nice as a guy being able to connect with the other women in the world, to be able to talk to other women in the world, not to get love or attention, but just to be able to put yourself out there again, that freedom is for the greater good. And just to then give a happy ending to this story, here I am, I'm 39, and I know you guys, well, Munich is like 37, Wimbledon's 33, Canada's 33, New York's 27, and Simon, Simon, you're 30, 31? No, I'm 28, actually. 28, sure. You, you're in a really nice, happy relationship, which is great. My friends who are like super wealthy, millionaires and billionaires, self-made in New York and Miami and London, they have wives and partners who are strong enough, mature enough women who they have kids with. There's about eight of them. And they grew out of that shit that younger women do that make life hard for us. And these are, these are really exceptional girlfriends. So they, you know, they'll test the waters with their partners and then they grow out of it. They just don't do it. Right. They, they're over it. So women do eventually grow out of it. The great ones do. And they're out there somewhere. Um, and they know what they want and they know what they're looking for and they know that their life is imperfect, but they are out there. So don't demonize women 
uh, they are out there and you'll eventually get into the relationships that won't break up with you. So yeah, there's a big spiel. I've got a good flow on, but thoughts and clarifications from that, agree, disagree. Just make sure you unmute yourself. Yeah, I feel like the whole yeah. distracting is, is a good point, but emphasis on, on positive distraction, it's not about, I think, especially when I was younger, I would tend to try to suppress my negative emotions with something more positive, whether it's sex or drinking or partying or drugs. <laughs> That's yeah. not positive. That is destructive. Yeah. And then, <laughs> then you just end up in this spiral and you kind of ignore your emotions. So I think that, that is an important point. Or and you're, and you're German. Our and video editor was just saying. I don't to deal with my emotions. <laughs> That's why I keep doing programs. It works for, <laughs> works for both of us. <laughs> it's fucking fun. <laughs> um, no, I, no, but I understand. And you know, Central European cultures are really not in touch with their with their emotions, and it causes frustration and anger. And behind closed doors, it can be domestic violence, abuse, alcoholism, yeah. all that bad stuff. So, a po positive distraction, and if that means going and trying something new or hanging out with new people. And then, you know, having a couple of emotional episodes, do it. I say to our, our, our clients, our potential clients, Simon, you know, go cry, be emotional. You will eventually be ready. It's better to be, you know, embrace your readiness sooner rather than later. You, you're never going to be perfectly ready. Just take the fucking leap and, and move forward because life, life is short, as we all know here in our 30s, that we're ticking towards not being young chickens anymore. That's what yeah. I have to say on that. And Stellian from Bulgaria with all the, you know, the dance clubs and the naked girls over there. He had a, he had a breakup today. He said, um, this, <laughs> he's saying this is exactly the same situation as me. The girl just keeps giving us hard times for no justifiable reason. And eventually you know, I said to my, my partner, she kept giving me a hard time because I think they just want reassurance. But eventually I thought that the, the prov provocation, I gave up. I'm like, I don't need to deal with your provocation anymore. I, I give up on trying to reassure you because if you don't believe in me as a good person by now, you never will. And I actually think that's your insecurity, not my bad character. And I, I love this girl. I took her to leave my parents. I loved her to the day that I put her on a boat and sent her away to focus more on my business, my job, my, my future, and some things that I want to figure out. So... Sorry to hear that, Stillian, but that's all right. You can get back into congruence with being the, the legend that you are over there in Bulgaria. Well, how about a last talking point? Anything to wrap things up? And uh, we'll continue next time we, we do a podcast. No, I think that's a positive note. I mean, yeah, break up and then have a big party in Havar. That's how you get over it. <laughs> you know, you know, like... Uh, uh, Wimbledon like I did break up with her the week before and but I wasn't trying to get you know get action and get attention from girls I love that everyone's having a great time I love that all the guys are having a great time I love that I executed a great event it was a pleasure a pleasure to speak to all the girls but I'm not doing it for photos with chicks or to get laid or anything like that I was actually really glad to spend time with you guys who in a, you know you're my roommate now Wimbledon at the time so you know it's as close as camaraderie as it gets well yeah we'll wrap it up guys that was brilliant i want to keep doing this and in terms of audio it goes out really nicely on the podcast platforms which we have which is fun um and i'll try to get some some real life video camera interviews which will present a little bit better on video on our social media channels you can ask us some questions i'll put them up ready for next week and i'll get a range of different guys and a few other things going on there's a million things to talk about. I'd love to have some of you guys back in Munich, Canada, of course, New York and Wimbledon. Simon's going to be emceeing all the time. Uh, have you guys next time around. Um, leave comments, good reviews, recommend to your friends. And of course, do a discovery call with us to do one of our live programs or do this kind of coaching with me live online with our mentorship or online tender programs because I'm going to bring the passion and trans, you know, give you the result that you're looking for, which is a very happy dating life, selection and abundance with women, not need to worry about what to do. All those problems will be solved when working together with me. Thanks, everyone. Wave with your little digital hands. Oh, no, you have no digital hands. Just nod your little Pokemon heads. <laughs> I think Munich's uh, frozen.
<laughs> it's so it's so weird talking to you robots. Now, thanks for helping out, guys. Um, I'll see all of you later.